Hey guys, we're talking Daytona week in this video. Now, if you feel like I'm leaving something out, I'm not covering exactly what you want to hear, you want to know like what positions are better for whatever race is going on, whether it be the duels, trucks, Smitty Cup Series this weekend, this opening week of Daytona, I'm going to ask that you consider watching this playlist that I put together of some of the videos that I've made previously on my channel over the years. Now I understand if you aren't happy with the fact that you know some of these are made some years ago, some were made last year, some were made in 22, but I talk about how optimals are, how they look like, how to build them, how... I, I cover every question you have, okay? If you are curious about the Daytona duels and you want to see data relating to that, I have an entire video just talking about the duels specifically. I have videos answering things specifically, okay? The reason why I made this is because I'd like people to refer to this whenever they have questions or whenever they want to know something because I think this is the most comprehensive playlist that anybody has made. There might be something better made in the future, but as of now, I've never seen anybody break every one of these situations down like I have. I have several review weekends uh, videos in here as well. This playlist in and of itself has nearly $25,000 worth of winnings that I have won on here. These are two live shows right before wins. This is a Talladega Spring review from last Talladega Spring, which won like $26, $2,500 or something. In that, like these are not just me talking through data points or like, well, you should be building. This, this is how I have built and how I have played and what I do. Okay, so if you have any questions related to that, or if you feel like this video doesn't answer some specific things, I would implore you to watch this. Now, yes, it's five hours long, but today is February 10th. You have a week until the Daytona 500. You can listen to this at the gym. You can listen to this when you're walking. This is going to help you out and help you understand where I'm coming from. Now that that's out of the way, I do have to say that for me personally, I have never made money. I have never found success playing guys who start up front, playing guys in the teens, and when races go green. I just haven't had luck chasing that. I know several people have. I know several people haven't. I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. If a race at Daytona or Talladega goes green, or if the guys in the back wreck themselves out early and they can't pass people, I have not made money in those races. Okay, entering these races, for those who may or may not know, there is one practice session, and it is for this week's races across all series, truck, Xfinity, cup, but there is one practice session, and that practice session is the only practice session for the entire year at these racetracks, okay? We have several young drivers, we're talking teenagers, in some of the lower series, we're talking people who have no talent in some of the lower series, who aren't able to practice, who don't have experience doing this, who this is like their first time at a real racetrack this fast or something like that. We are seeing that the amount of accidents and the amount of people DNFing and the amount of races going green outside of the Cup Series have been increasing. Okay, so like for the truck specifically this weekend, we'll probably wreck excuse me, we'll probably wreck 70 to 75% of the field at some point. Does that mean they were all DNF? No, but at least 75% of the trucks in the truck series will be involved in an accident. Now, if they can repair that, well, then they're going to keep going. If they can't, then they won't. Same with Xfinity, and most likely for the Daytona 500 and the summer Daytona race, we're going to have at least 85% of the cup cars involved in a crash at some point, whether that's them flying into a catch fence upside down or just hitting somebody while they're, spin while they're spinning. We're going to have 85% of the cars have damage in some form or fashion in these races, okay? So now that we look at that, when we look at this in terms of a fantasy aspect and we think of like the millionaire maker, correct, this, this weekend, for those of you who may or may not be a fan of racing or whatever, and you see that and you say... And you, and you run into a situation to where, like, oh, we need to avoid stacking from the back 
and we need to focus on getting unique. We need to focus on chasing the optimal lineup. We need to just focus on having, um, what is it, non-duped lines, okay? Well, the only way you're going to have lines that are very low-owned and low-duplicated is when you play guys up front, okay? Now, I have to warn highly against that. I have to warn against getting too stupid and too cute and so on and so forth here, okay? When I look at races and how they have performed and even getting unique and, and stuff like that, you we don't have to like get stupid. We don't have to play guys way up here. We also don't want to avoid people who have bad track history at these races. Like, for example, Martin Truex Jr. is somebody who has traditionally been seen as somebody who can't race well on plate races and stuff. You need to throw all of that out the window when you're actually trying to figure out how to build lineups. This, is, this week is all about ownership and what the perceived value of drivers are in the public's eye. For example, let's bring up some drivers really fast. This is a big data point that people will use, maybe not specifically racing reference, because this is just showing the last 10 races. But a lot of what we're going to see, let's talk Cup Series and focus on the Daytona 500 and stuff. Also, I'll be live Thursday for the duels, Friday for the truck race, Saturday for the Xfinity Series race, and Sunday for the Cup Series race. So, like, we can look forward to that. And I'll probably do a, a duel video as well, probably, like, on Tuesday for people who, like, will watch that. I don't expect a lot of views and stuff. But... This is, this is basically what people are going to be looking at when we enter this weekend. And it's the track history of Daytona and Talladega of individual drivers. They're going to sort them by average finishing position and or like finishing percentage and view that as, well, these guys are good drivers. The people who don't finish races are bad drivers and that is going to literally determine ownership. So like when we look at the starting grid based off of the duels, you're going to have some good guys in the back in terms of your big name, your big team. We might have some Joe Gibbs drivers back here. We might have some Hendrick cars back here. We might have some Penske cars back here. Then you're also going to have some legacy motorsport clubs. We're going to have some front row cars. We're going to have some Rick Ware cars. We're going to have open cars who don't have charters you're going to have some colleague cars mixed in with all the good drivers and all the good names and good teams and so when people are looking at how they're going to build their lineups okay they're going to be like well this person is in a good car he's going to gain 15 positions this guy that, yeah this guy is in a open car an underfunded car he's only going to gain possibly five positions. And then they will look at the, if you can see this, they're going to look at the projected uh, DraftKings points combined. Like this will, the, the projected points will stem from like, oh, Kyle Busch is starting like 20 second, or he's starting like 30 second or whatever. He had a bad dual race. Their, their whole sheets are going to pull up if I can get there, like, oh, he actually like finishes races. He had he has some top tens. He has some he has a high likelihood of gaining positions, and then that's just going to push people towards certain plays and these other plays. Who might I remind you, eighty five percent of the cars will be involved in a wreck at some point in this race. There is a high likelihood that sixty five percent of the field will DNF in this race. In these races, they won't finish. So why on earth? Would some people, would some drivers, just based on projections alone, you know, just based on, like, some guys are going to look great, others aren't, like, what are we talking about? This might be, like, how projections stack up. You see some guys projected to score, like, 20, 16, maybe they don't do that well. Let's uh, let's start projecting guys who, like, oh, Denny Hamlin starts 30th. Well, he'll probably get a top 10, you know, we're going to have these guys, like, be able to pass some people. You're going to have these guys, like these guys are slow, and this is how projections will look. You'll have the good drivers projected to, to be to be good. You're going to have the bad drivers projected to be bad. When they throw these in, like, their optimizers or whatever, they're going to spit out lineups that are actively avoiding the bad plays. Well, projections don't matter for these races. Like, 65% of the field is going to get wrecked anyways. So if everybody has that percentage... Why would, it makes no sense 
to play people who are expected to be like 35, 40, 45 percent owned when if everybody has the same likelihood of being involved in a wreck, then ownership should by definition be spread out. We've seen this before. Okay, so like that's what I mean when I play when I say play ownership, you play people who aren't being played in the back half of the field. The reason I bring that up is I'm for sure we're for sure going to see it cuz people are going to try and get unique. People are going to try and get different. They're going to understand that oh, we don't we don't need to play all the good plays. We need to get different and what the optimizer is going to do, what they're going to manually do is instead of getting different in like the back half of the field, they're going to be like, "Oh, I'm going to take, you know, the the good plays this guy is projected for 52 this guy's for 39 43 i'm going to get a little different and play you know these two guys so we got one two three four five and then to really to really get the line different to really be unique i'm just going to play the guy starting ninth no one's going to do that and then that's not going to work that you're you're handicapping yourself by doing that or it'll be even more aggressive they don't play as many people back here and they're like well we need to get cute i'll play the guy in ninth and in 14th that'll be unique we got four guys in the back of the field we got a guy 19 we got a guy 14th and ninth well when you when when you review races and if you actually watch how the scoring breaks down which i encourage you guys to do i don't give a shit about how much money you're winning you're losing that doesn't matter once the lineup is locked just act like that money doesn't exist. You threw it in the fire. Well, what can you learn by watching how lineups are scoring and how they're not scoring and stuff? These types of builds, which yet again, I talk about specifically in Super Speedway lineups visualized. You can see, hey, you know, the lineup I just kind of chased and, and the lineup that I just kind of like showed here is looking kind of similar to you know, some of these in here. Well, these are like never played. This is like trying to get, you know, not even like a pick six or like a trifecta or superfecta in horse racing. This is literally like there's no way to project the optimal lineup. And the optimal lineup is very rarely ever, ever played. I don't believe that type of risk is even needed, especially when these weeks, when people actually wreck. Not only do you make your money, you make up enough money to handle any races that end up going green for me or like for me when i view the 96 race slate that we have on DraftKings for these races i view we have the three opening ones at daytona three at talladega at some point two at daytona and two more at talladega i understand that at least seven eight nine of those races are not going to go my way or they will, but it'll, I'll wreck the wrong people. The wrong people in my lineups will be taken out, so on and so forth. But if you can score well in one or two of those by being very aggressive, playing ownership in the back, stacking from the back, it carries you far past what it, what it, what you're going to be spending at all those races. Okay, like for me, if you're doing 20 lines, just in the um, we won't say the millionaire maker because it's the most expensive one. But say like if you're doing 20 lines in like a usual truck series, $10 contest, that's $200. If you can finish in the top 10 of that contest and certainly score well, or maybe you're doing 20 in the 10, 20 in the 4, 20 in the 1s, you take that $300 and you can actually score well. Like, hey, you know, that's kind of what happened at Talladega here. You know, we did poor in the Cup Series one, but I did well in the Talladega one. And that Tal I didn't even win the contest. And that Talladega Xfinity Series race covered me for the entire year of plate races and stuff. So, like, there's just, there's just no reason to get different. The main focus at these races are ownership, okay? It, it, salaries don't matter. Drivers don't matter. The reason I bring this up is, like, who are people that look bad? Who are people that end up looking bad. And when you look at all these people, look, nearly everybody has at least two top tens. That shows that anybody can finish. When we look at half of the field, nearly half of the field has at least one top five of the last 10 races, which is like two and a half years. When you look at these races specifically and you look at um, average finish, yeah, sure, you're going to have some people who have like escaped being involved in wrecks. 
But like even Ryan Blaney, like, oh, Ryan Blaney is a good driver, but he like recreated Dale Earnhardt's wreck last summer when he like absolutely got cleaned out here, got hosed here, you know? Like it, it just doesn't matter. You see for a vast majority of people, all this is within the same outside of like part-timers who have only done like two, five races and whatnot. You, the entire field has an average finishing position between 22 and like 15. So like they're, that's it. You know, hey, what leans like Ryan Blaney? Why has Blaney survived more races than other people? Well, I answer that in the film study, in the uh, what makes a good plate racer. I answer that question. Why do some people perform better? Why do some people perform, wor perform worse? That's usually determined by how they're racing in the race, how skillful they are in the pack. Because there are people like Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin's probably the best person in the field currently at plate racing and you're going to see that he has the 11th best average finish so like i'm sure somebody's going to want to argue with me that he's not that good or whatever but i would argue that denny hamlin has the highest iq when it comes to this racing and this isn't because the stupid nascar racing show on netflix told me that you know denny hamlin felt something weird in his plums and he like moved out of the pack to avoid the wreck like this guy actually knows what he's doing okay Yes, he's involved in wrecks sometimes, but when he isn't involved in wrecks, he actually knows how to finish races, okay? So we typically see Hamlin be played a lot. Why is he played a lot? Because he's good. When he, when, but he's played a lot. He's normally one of the most played drivers, so it's advantageous to fade him, okay? I know it's like that's very contradicting because, wow, he, you know, he's a good plate racer. You know, sometimes he, he just gets caught up in wrecks, okay? But yet again... He's the best plate racer. Yet again, 65% of the people get involved in wrecks in these, or DNF in these races. About 80% of the cars will have damage in some point in the race. Why, out of a field of 40 cars, would you play somebody who usually carries ownership either in the 30s or low 40s? It makes no sense whatsoever. That's how you get different in these races. You don't have to get idiotic and play guys up front. You don't have to get stupid and do that. You just say, hmm, this guy is projected to be the first, second, third, or fourth highest driver in this event. Their ownership is around 40%. 65% of the field gets wrecked. Why is why why are we playing somebody this much? So you just don't play that. That's what you do to get different. Like between 20th and 40th, we're going to have guys carry more ownership than others, okay? We don't have to play guys up here to get different. We can just play the lowest, the lower owned drivers between 20th and 40th. That's all we got to do. This is not rocket science. The only, the only way this approach doesn't work is if the race goes green, which for me personally, I'm perfectly fine with that, okay? Because if it goes green, well, then we're just chasing some wild, wild shit. Because that requires people not wrecking. That requires people not making mistakes up front in the race. Typically, wrecks nowadays are started up front, either have an accordion effect that causes, you know, people from 8th to 19th get involved in wrecks or have the wreck start there, or the true leaders just wreck themselves. Okay, so if this race is going green and the people are, that are up front and the people that are up front because they're Good drivers and good equipment, that means, like, if you line everybody up, if you line the, the field up like this, and you look at their average finish, like, this is the running position that you would see. Okay, we're not going to really talk about Reagan. We're not going to really talk about Kurt Busch because Kurt Busch uh, has, a con has a concussion and died, and he's no longer racing. But we see, hey, Ryan Blaney, the guy who's finished the most races, he's usually running up front. Hey, Bubba Wallace is usually running up front. Hey, Denny Hamlin knows what he's doing. He's normally riding with Bubba Wallace. He's normally riding with some of his teammates up front. These guys want to be up front. Eric Amarola knows how to drive. He's been optimal several times. He wants to be up front. Bowman, Hendrick cars up front. It makes sense. It like when I made my video a week ago or maybe two weeks ago at this point, and I said, it's easy to project and make projections for these races. Yeah. I just showed you like if, if you have like Eric Amarola, Alex Bowman, Ryan Blaney starting back here. Yes, you're going to project them to be top 10 finishers because that's where they would be. Okay. 
like the projection isn't wrong. Like when you line them up based on skill level, that's where they're going to be at. Okay. But say if this is like the true running order of the race, minus like Kurt Busch and David Reagan, and you know, we're late in the race or whatever. We're coming down to like three to go. We're racing hard for the lead. And oh man, sixth place made a mistake. Kyle Busch makes a mistake. He's the, he's, you know, he's the first car on the outside lane. We, we, we got some guys running three wide behind him. Kyle Busch makes a mistake, gets in the wall, comes back down in front of traffic, and that traffic just happens to be 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. These guys get collected. Some of the guys in the 20s pile into them. They're collected. You have, you know, a 10, 11, 12 car pileup that started because a sixth place driver, Kyle Busch, a, the good driver running up front because he's good, makes a mistake, gets involved in the wreck, and you take out people who are running up front because they're good. And the, the bad plays, the part-time drivers, the cars with, uh, with less, you know, not air, air, air time because everybody has equal time now, but like the lower tier teams or the worst teams, like the back half of the field, because they're not up there, they don't get involved in the wreck. Yet again, this is explained in detail in the film study, in how I build these lineups. I break them down more here. We have to try and get an idea of where people are going to be running. You know, when they run the way they should and there's a wreck up front because that's where the wreck happens, it takes out the good plays. It takes out the people who are projecting well. That's why you hedge against that. You just lean, hey, these guys are more than likely to wreck at some point. I'm just going to play the guys who aren't going to be up there in the in the front. That like that's the first starting point, you know, and enough and, and people don't do that enough. I cannot reiterate enough that this weekend is based purely on ownership. OK, that that is literally the only thing I use to build lineups. OK, I build the projections that how they would how they should how the driver should do, like in a perfect world. Because how else do you build projections for these races that have wrecks? You can't. You know, I've done it both ways to where I like force the bad guys to be projected well, so optimizers use them. But I don't like. First off, I also hand built everything for these weeks. I've never used an optimizer for this at all. I don't believe they even come fucking close to being able to do what I want to do. I have very few lines. I, I rarely ever have lines duplicated. I just think this is a week that you want to hand build specifically. Um, if I keep winning contests, I'm going to fucking max out the millionaire maker. And I'm going to hand build all 150 of those lines if that ever happens. But uh, for the most part, I'm probably just going to do probably like 10 to 20 in that. But I, I'm probably going to do 20 for every slate. Um, but ownership is where it's at. Like that, That's the only way to go about this race. I don't want to hear anything else. I'm not open to hearing anything else. I just, it, it just hasn't worked for me. Doing anything else but playing ownership and playing for Rex, it's never worked for me. So that's kind of the, the quick intro to the Daytona weekend. Like I said, if you feel like I didn't talk about enough or focus on anything, I have five hours of content diving deep into the stats, deep into the data, answering this stuff. I just don't want to repeat myself for like the eighth year in a row or whatever it is. So uh, anyway, that's the quick intro to Daytona week. Uh, there will probably be a, a, a dual video. I'll, I guess I'll make Tuesday or up, probably make Monday. And uh, past that, live shows Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, this week. And I will see you guys then. Uh, feel free to talk to me or ask me anything in the Discord related to this stuff. And I hope you guys out help you out as, help you out as much as you need me to. And uh, past that, thank you for being here and uh, consider joining TrueDFS to support me, support the work that I do, and support all the things that Sheets and Bobby are doing because Sheets is just winning everything. I mean, I'm watch I have a sweat right now in, in the NBA game, and, and who's who's currently winning that right now? It's Sheets. So, like, this, this guy just wins in everything, guys. So, anyway, I will see you guys later.